of you grew up going to church? Did you go to Sunday school too? All right. I, I grew up going to church. I grew up going to Sunday school. And uh, we studied a lot of things. We always went through something called the quarterly. I never did enjoy the quarterly. But every once in a while, we had a rogue Sunday school teacher. And they would get off and really teach the Bible. And I always enjoyed that, even though I wasn't a Christian until I, I turned 20 years old. But there was one story that always kind of fascinated me because when I read the story, I could not picture Jesus doing it. It's the story of Jesus cleansing the temple, especially sitting down and making this little whip and then going in and cleansing the temple. And I never quite understood that. And the reason I didn't understand is because it really didn't fit, in my mind, Jesus' nature. How many of you are like that? Well, we're going to study that this morning. We're going to find out something interesting. And we're going to find out that it, it fits Jesus' nature exactly. It fits it to a T. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of John, chapter 2. We're going to read verses 13 through 17. It says, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sowed oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made him of a whip of cords, that's what fascinated me. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sow doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Now, you'll never understand the story of the cleansing of the temple until you study this passage of scripture from a Jewish perspective. In fact, the majority of the Bible should be studied from a Jewish perspective. You see, one of the main reasons that we misinterpret Scripture is because we study it from a Gentile perspective. And the church as a whole has been guilty of doing this uh, ever since the second century. But what's so sad about this is that Christianity was never intended to be separated from Judaism. The truth is, Jesus was a Jew. And if you want to get technical, he was and is the Jewish Messiah. And the very first believers were Jews who worshipped in the Jewish synagogue. In fact, when Christianity began, it was actually considered to be a sect of Judaism. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 28, verses 21 and 22, and I'll prove it to you. Notice what it says. They replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of our people have come from here, from there, has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are. For we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. Do you see that? In the first century, Christianity was considered to be a sect of Judaism. Now, everyone knows what I mean by sect, right? A sect is a group of people who share a common belief that's a little bit different than the larger group they belong to. So what I'm telling you is that in the beginning, Christianity was considered to be a part of Judaism. But they believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, whereas the majority of Jews did not. So they were considered to be a sect of Judaism. So you had all of these Jews who were looking for a Messiah. So when Jesus came, a small portion believed that Jesus fulfilled those Messianic scriptures and he was the Messiah, but they were the minority. The majority of Jews did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Therefore, Christianity was considered to be a sect of Judaism, a small group within the Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. But the point that I'm trying to make is this. You cannot separate Christianity from Judaism because it comes from Judaism. It's rooted in Judaism, so you can't separate it from Judaism and treat it as if it has nothing to do with it. You can't do that. Yet that's exactly what happened when Israel as a whole rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts 28, and let's read verses 23 through 28. They, these are the Jewish leaders of Rome. There's a big debate that goes on, but it really shouldn't be a debate. The book of Romans was actually written to Jews. They were Christian Jews who believed in Jesus. They were that sect. But you need to understand that the majority uh, of Christians in the early church were Jews. 
Now, in Rome, you had a large Jewish popula population. So this is what this is talking about, Acts 28. This large Jewish population. They, the Jewish leaders of Rome, arranged to meet Paul on a certain day. And, it came, and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning until evening. You think I'm long-winded. He ministered to them from morning until evening. Explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but the others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. So, according to this, some of the Jews believed in Jesus, but the majority of them didn't. Now, look at John chapter 1, verse number 11. It says, he, who is he? Jesus. Jesus came to his own people and they rejected him. And of course, as I said, this is talking about Jesus. He came as the Jewish Messiah, and the Jews as a whole rejected him. So basically, here's what's ha what happened. The majority of the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah, and as a result, they kicked the Jews who believed in Jesus out of the synagogue. So the Jews who believed in Jesus went into the Gentiles, and the Gentiles received the gospel, and Christianity began to flourish. Now... That wouldn't have been a problem if the Gentiles hadn't changed Christianity to fit their culture and their values, but they did. You see, having been spurned by Judaism, Christians reacted in kind, and they spurned the Jews or Judaism. But that created a problem, because without a correct understanding of Judaism, much of the Bible doesn't make sense. And that's because the events that are recorded in the Bible took place within a Jewish culture. So if you don't understand the Jewish culture, then the stories in the Bible won't make, make any sense. At least they won't make any sense to you. Now, with that said, let's go back to our text in John chapter 2. And let's interpret what Jesus did when he cleansed the temple in the light of Judaism. Let's do that. So turn to John chapter 2 and let's read verse number 13 again. It says... Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, the first thing that we should notice is that this event took place during the Passover, or at the time of the Passover. Do you see that? So these two things are linked together, Passover and the cleansing of the temple. You cannot separate the cleansing of the temple from Passover. Now, if you don't link these two things together, then you don't understand why Jesus cleansed the temple. In fact, let me stop right here for a second, and let me give you some background information about Passover and the feast. And this is why you have to understand Judaism. Because everything in the Bible is based on the Jewish culture, it's based on Jewish values, it's based on Jewish practices, uh, everything about it. So, let me explain something about the feast of Passover. Every Jewish man living in the land of Israel was required to attend three different feasts every year in Jerusalem. Turn to Exodus chapter 23, and let's read verses 14 through 17, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Each year, you must celebrate three festivals or three feasts in my honor. First, celebrate the festival of unleavened bread, also known as Passover. For seven days, the bread you eat must be made without yeast, just as I commanded you. Celebrate this festival annually at the appointed time in early spring in the month of Abib. In fact, how many of you know what Abib means? Anyone? Well, it can also be pronounced Aviv, but Aviv is when the barley ripens. And the reason the Jews referred to the first month as the, as the month of Aviv is because... When they were in Egypt, 
and Moses came, and they had the last plague, of course, but the firstborn of, of everyone died if you didn't have the Passover. This is all about Passover, remember that. Uh, they were able to be uh, set free from, from uh, Egypt, and so that's what Exodus means. They actually left Egypt, and when they left Egypt, they left at the time that the barley was ripe. And Aviv actually means ripe. And so it's tied to that festival. So that's what they call their very first month. It's called Aviv. Some people pronounce it Aviv. The V and the V and Bet can be B or V. So notice what it says. Appointed time in early spring in the month of Aviv, for that is the anniversary of your departure from Egypt. No one may appear before me without an offering. Second, celebrate the festival of harvest, also known as Pentecost. That's when the wheat comes ripe. It's, it's, so you've got the barley harvest and you've got the wheat harvest. Barley comes first and then the wheat is next. So you celebrate the festival of harvest, also known as Pentecost, when you bring me the first crops of your harvest. Finally, celebrate the festival of the final harvest, also known as the Feast of Temples or the Feast of Trumpets. Most of us don't know this, but when the last trump was sounded, you're out there, you're harvesting everything that's supposed to come in during this fall uh, uh, time of harvest, and you leave everything to be assembled together. The Feast of Trumpets is actually prophetical. It's talking about the return of Jesus Christ when the rapture occurs. At that final harvest, everything is left, and psh, we go, and we're assembled together with Jesus. But anyways, that's, that's another teaching. So... He keeps going. At the end of the harvest season, when you have harvested all the crops from your fields, at these three times each year, every man in Israel must appear before the sovereign, the Lord. So it was required for every Jewish male over the age of 13 who lived in Israel to go up to Jerusalem three times a year to celebrate these three feasts. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Trumpets. Now the Feast of Passover was actually three feasts in one. Three feasts in one. The Feast of Passover, which began on the 14th of Nisan. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which began on the 15th and lasted for seven days. And the Feast of First Fruits, which was, which was always celebrated on a Sunday during the week of Unleavened Bread. Now, these were three separate feasts. But because they overlapped each other during an eight-day period, they were thought of as one big feast. So it was common for the Jews to refer to all three feasts as one feast, the Feast of Passover, because it was the first one celebrated. You actually sacrificed your lamb on the 14th of Nisan. You took your sacrificial lamb back to the house because Jerusalem was supposed to open up to their family members or to other people, and they would bring it back to the house. They would begin roasting it, but then the sun would set, and that's when they would enjoy the meal. Now remember that the Jews celebrate their days a little bit differently than ours, or they reckon time differently. Our time is reckoned from midnight to midnight. So after midnight, we start another day. And that day goes all the way to midnight, and one minute after midnight, or just after midnight, another day starts. Jews did not celebrate time that way. They reckon time from sundown to sundown. So... If you're out working that day and you come home and the sun begins to go down, you wash up, you get ready for the meal. If the sun goes down, a new day begins. Everyone with me? Yeah. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread began on the night of Passover. And when the feast began, no leaven could be in your house anywhere. So each home had to be rigorously examined and double-checked by the males of each household. Because any leaven that was left in the house would cause ceremonial defilement. In other words, it would be a breaking of the law and you wouldn't be able to celebrate Passover. And you had to celebrate Passover. Now, as most of you know, leaven is a symbol of sin. It's a symbol of sin because sin works in the very same manner as leaven does. You see, it only takes a little bit of leaven to leaven a whole lump of dough. And sin works the very same way. All it takes is one sin to corrupt a man's soul and to make that man unrighteous. And for that reason, leaven has always been used as a symbol for sin in the Bible. Now, turn back to John chapter 2 and let's read verses 13 and 14 again. 
Because now you know all of the Jewish customs and the practices that you need to know in order to interpret this story of Jesus cleansing the temple. So let's read it again. Now, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sowed oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. Now, I want you to notice that in verse 14, Jesus obeyed the law. And he went to his father's house, which was the temple, to examine it for leaven and to remove it, lest his father's house be ceremonial, ceremonially defiled. And what did he find? He found men selling oxen, sheep, and doves. And he found money changers. In other words, he found covetousness, extortion, and idolatry, which is sin, or as the Bible defines it, leaven. Now, how do we know that Jesus found covetousness, extortion, and idolatry? And how do we know that these three things are considered to be leaven? Well, let me show you. Here in John chapter 2, Jesus accused these men of making the temple a house of merchandise. But in Matthew chapter 21, verse number 13, he accused these men of turning his father's house into a den of thieves. Look at Matthew 21, 13, and I want you to underline the word thieves. It says, and he said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, the whole reason a thief wants to steal is because he wants what's not his. In other words, he wants what somebody else has, and he's willing to sin in order to give it, in order to get it. And what is that? That's coveting. Anyone know the difference between coveting and desire? See, sometimes we think if we desire something, we're coveting. And that's not what coveting is. Coveting is when you want something that someone else has and you're willing to sin in order to get it. If, if your neighbor buys a new bass boat and you look at it and you go, boy, I'd really like a new nut bass boat. And you get to the point where you want a new bass boat, you're not coveting unless you're willing to sin in order to get it. If you're willing to sin in order to get it, it's coveting. And that's the difference between simply desiring something and coveting it. If you're willing to sin in order to get it, you're no longer desiring it, you're coveting it. Now, covetousness in the Bible is also classified as idolatry. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse number 5, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Paul is writing to the church of Colossae. It's called Colossians. And He's explaining a few things to them, and this is what he says. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. There are certain things about our atomic nature that doesn't belong in heaven. What's great about the rapture is that when we are transformed and we get our glorified body, we're no longer going to have the atomic nature. So all of the sinful things that go along with the atomic nature, we're going to be set free from. But here Paul is explaining what kind of comes natural with the atomic nature. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and then he says, and greed, which is idolatry. Do you see that? Greed is considered to be idolatry. Now here's what's interesting. The word greed... In the, in the original language, is the very same word that's used for coveting. Yeah. In fact, the King James Version doesn't, re, doesn't translate this as greed. It translated as covetousness. So it says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, why is covetousness and greed the same word? Because that's what it is. Greed makes you want to do things that you shouldn't do. You're willing to sin in order to get what you want. Therefore, greed and covetousness are synonymous. Now, the reason covetousness is classified as idolatry, the reason greed is, is because when a person is greedy, money becomes their God. It's what they serve, and it's what they worship. And that's why it's classified as idolatry. So Jesus found a den of thieves in the temple. In other words, he found covetousness and idolatry. But it gets worse because history tells us that at the time of Christ, 
The priests were using their, pos their position in order to extort the people. Everyone knows what extortion is, right? Extortion is the illegal use of one's official position or authority to obtain property or to obtain financial gain. And that's exactly what the priests were doing. You see, the priests were in cahoots with the merchants. In fact, the Jewish Talmud says that the market in the temple was called the bazaars of the sons of Annas, or the son of Annas. Annas was the high priest before Caiaphas, and he was also the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And if you remember, Caiaphas was the high priest at the time of Jesus. Yeah, he was the high priest at the time of Jesus. Now, the way that Annas and Caiaphas obtained the position of high priest was they purchased it. You see, the Roman Empire appointed the high priest once they conquered Israel. And the reason they began to, uh, or the reason that they appointed the high priest is because they wanted to make sure that the person in that position was loyal to Rome. Because if the person in that position was not loyal to Rome, they had the influence to be able to cause a rebellion. And so when Rome conquered Israel, no longer could you just be the high priest, but you had to be appointed by the Roman government. And the way that you were appointed is you purchased it. Yeah. So if you wanted to be the high priest, you had to pay for it. And according to Morse Vinden, the office of a high priest sold for about a million dollars in today's currency. Now, that was several years ago when he wrote that. So probably today it'd be two or three million dollars in today's currency. But trust me, the high priest had a nifty way of recovering his investment. You see, the priests were responsible for inspecting the sacrifices of the animals or the sacrificial animals. And if there were any blemishes, they were rejected. So here's what the priests did. They would inspect every animal before they sacrificed it until they found any little excuse to reject it. And that forced the people to buy another animal from the temple market that was set up in the court of the Gentiles. You can go all the way back home. You traveled for days to get to Jerusalem. You brought your sacrifice, your best one. So now that you get to the point where you're ready to sacrifice, the priest comes in because they're the ones that's going to cut the throat. You as the male of the house lays your hand upon the animal in order to identify with that animal. But it is the priest that takes the knife, cuts the throat, holds the bow, then takes that bow to throw it upon the altar. That bowl of blood. Yeah. Yeah. But before they did that, they would inspect the animal. And they were looking for any little excuse to be able to reject it. So if you brought your animal for sacrifice and the priest rejected it, the market in the temple would take that animal as a trade-in, and then he would charge you a hefty price for an animal that was already inspected and marked. Yeah. We know this because of Josephus. In fact, that's how they knew if a person had brought their animal or had bought their animal from the market or not. It was, if it was from their market, it was marked. So what they were really doing when they were trying to inspect this animal is they were looking for the mark. And if it was marked, they would go, oh, yes, this animal is good. And people, they made big money doing this. In fact, Edersheim, who was a Jewish scholar, estimates that the high priest probably made a profit of about $300,000 a year by pulling this scam. Now, that number is no longer current because of inflation, but I want you to understand, if we use that million dollars, it took about three and a half years to pay, uh, to be able to pay back what the investment was to purchase the high, office of the high priest. Now, the high priest made about $300,000 per year doing this scam, but that was after he gave his cut to the priest who were inspecting the animals. So the priest and the high priest were in cahoots. In fact, they're the ones who owned the temple markets. So basically, the priests were forcing the people to use their animals, and that's extortion. That's extortion. Remember what extortion is. Extortion is the illegal use of your official position or authority to obtain financial property or financial gain. And that's exactly what they were doing. So when Jesus went to the temple, he found covetousness, idolatry, and extortion. In other words, he found leaven in the temple of God. And it's Passover. And on Passover, you're supposed to remove all leaven from your house. So Jesus had no other choice but to remove it. 
So he drove out the merchants who were selling animals. And he overturned the tables of the money changers, and he made them leave the temple mount, something the priests should have done, but they didn't because they were the thieves. They were the ones making money off of this. Now, turn back to John chapter 2, and let's read verses 15 and 16, and let me show you something about the character and nature of Jesus. Notice what it says. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Now, you need to understand the truth is in the details. So when we're reading this story, we have to look at the details. And we have to notice how Jesus acted and exactly what he did. And I want you to notice that Jesus drove the sheep and oxen out. That's what it says. Look in verse 15. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out. When you read that, that's a term used for animals. Jesus did not use his whip of cords on the people. He made the whip of cords to drive out the sheep, the goats, the cattle. He drove them all out of the temple. Then it says he poured out the changers' money. He walked over to their tables. He picked up their money. He didn't use a whip of cords. He simply took it and he poured it on the ground. But I also want you to notice, he allowed those who were selling doves to carry the cages out. Notice what he says in verse 16. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Now, why did Jesus do that? Well, turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13, uh, verse 13, and let's find out. Notice what it says. Everyone knows that Isaiah 52 is all about the Messiah, right? It's a Messianic prophecy. So this is all about the Messiah, which we believe Jesus is that Messiah. So it's all about Jesus. Notice what it says. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Now, as I said, this is a Messianic prophecy, and it says something very interesting about the Messiah. It says that he will deal prudently with people. Now, I want you to underline that word prudently. Prudently is translated from the Hebrew word sakal, sakal. And it means to exercise sound judgment in practical matters and to have keen insight in dealing with people. And this explains why Jesus did what he did. You see, the reason that Jesus drove the oxen sheep out of the temple was because there was no danger of them being lost. They were marked. They were marked to let you know who they belonged to. And the reason he poured out the money was because it was easily picked up. And it could be counted to make sure you picked them all up. But he didn't turn the doves loose. Instead, he allowed the merchants to carry them out because they would have flown away and been lost to their owners. So as you can see, even in his zeal, Christ dealt prudently. And people, that's really comforting to know because whenever Jesus deals with us, he does so prudently. Isn't that good to know? In fact, listen to me. Jesus will never do anything to you that will cause permanent harm. You might think it will. You might think you're going through the worst thing in the world and you're saying, God, why would you allow this? Why are you doing this? But I want you to understand, he's cleaning out the leaven. But he'll never do anything to you that will cause permanent harm. That's the way he is. And this story is in complete, um, it's in alignment with who Jesus is, with his character and his nature. Now, let me take this a step further because this is symbolic of what Christ does for us, with us, and in us. You see, our bodies are the temple of God, which have been corrupted by sin. 
Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Notice what it says. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Now, some of you treat your bodies, your temple, much better than others do. The majority of you treat your temple better than I treat my temple. I'm working on that. It starts up here first, right? I got to work on that. But anyways, he says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Why? Because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Yeah, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, once you're born again, now dwells within you. Yeah. I practice the presence of the Spirit. Many times when I'm praying, I stop and I start thinking about, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. I died with Christ. I descended into hell with Christ. And when all my sin was paid for, when God raised him from the dead, I was resurrected with Christ. The moment he came alive, I was born again. I was regenerated. And the same spirit that raised him from the dead now dwells within me. And many times I have to get quiet to hear the Holy Spirit. But you need to understand, if you're a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And then it goes further. You do not belong to yourself. Because now, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And you're a temple unto God. Now, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Christ is our Passover. And the leaven must be removed from our life. Go ahead and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Notice what it says. It says, get rid of the leaven. What's he mean, get rid of the leaven? Get rid of the sin in your life. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without leaven, which is what you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Now, here's what I want you to see. By cleansing the temple... Jesus was symbolically announcing his ultimate mission. By cleaning the temple, he was telling people, this is what I've come to do. Which is to cleanse our heart from sin, also known as leaven, so the Holy Spirit can dwell inside of us. Remember, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Christ is our Passover. And just as Christ cleansed the temple, he wants to cleanse us from our sin. That's what we need to understand. You know, whenever you study a passage of Scripture, you need to study that passage of Scripture in its context. So let me go a little bit deeper in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 7. If you remember what happened in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you had a person within the, in the church who was committing sexual immorality. He was doing something even the heathen don't do. He was sleeping with his father's wife, incest. And because the Corinthian church was all into grace, they thought that this was wonderful, that this person was a sinner, but he's still welcome in our church. And Paul says, what in the world are you doing? You as individuals, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when you come together corporately, you are the church, you are the body of Christ, and you're not supposed to have sin. And he tells them, you got to kick this guy out of the church for his good. Because he thinks this is all right, and he thinks he's going to heaven, but he doesn't realize unless Jesus is Lord of your life, and if Jesus is Lord, you won't be doing this. If Jesus isn't Lord of your life, you're not going to heaven. Some of you think, just because you said a prayer. Some of you think just because you believe in Jesus, you're going to heaven. Let me just tell you this. Even the demons believe and tremble, but they're not going to heaven. The Bible teaches lordship salvation. When you get to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says, If thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, and confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes in the righteous, and with the mouth confession is made in his salvation. You have to confess Jesus as Lord. 
And the reason we're supposed to confess is because what we confess to, we're committed to. You know why we don't want to tell people what we're going to do? Because then we have to do it. Because they're going to say, well, I thought you were going to do this. And we don't want to be committed to it, so we don't confess it. But God tells us we have to believe in our hearts, faith, and we have to confess that Jesus is Lord, my Lord. And so he tells the Corinthian church, Paul does, you got to kick this guy out for his own good so his soul can be saved in the day of the Lord. But here's what he tells them. I want to read verse 6 all the way to verse 8. Your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? You get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate this feast, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. Every time we come together, we are celebrating what Jesus has done. But we're to celebrate without leaven. Because the whole purpose of Jesus dying for us was to redeem us from our sin. And you want to know what's wrong with the church today? You want to know what's wrong with America today? It's because the church is not salt and light. It's because people who claim to be Christians come inside the church and they're living in sin. And we are weak and we are impotent. And let me tell you what's needed. What's needed is for Christ to dwell, to deal with each one of us and to drive out this sin in us. To overturn the things that we've set up. And for us to get rid of that leaven. It's a time to repent. You look at what's happening in the world today. And let me tell you what I believe. I personally believe we're getting closer and closer to the return of Jesus. And let me tell you, when you study the book of Revelation, the seven churches in Revelation... They're written in a specific order. And the message that was given to each church was a message for that day. But it's also a message for church history. Because when you study those churches and the message that's given to it, each one of those churches represents a period in church history. If they were put in any other order, it wouldn't work. But they were put in a specific order so that when you study church history, you literally see church history pulled out right before your eyes because it was prophetic. And you get to the very last church, Church of Laodicea. And it's the church that's liberal. It's the church that's powerless. It's the church that doesn't even believe. That's where we are. And as we get closer and closer in, let me tell you, it's not going to get better. It's not going to get better. Things are, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be a Betty Downer, all right? I'm not Karen. <laughs> I want you to understand that the Bible says as we get towards the end days, things get better and things get worse. It's the best of times and the worst of times. It's the best of times in the sense that with technology, life has never been easier. But it will be the worst of times, and we're speaking more, uh, according to morality and immorality. Yeah. And you're going to see these problems are going to continue on with earthquakes and all of the birth pains. I hope to teach on the birth pain shortly. But here's what I want you to see. The closer we get to it, the faster things happen. My dad always said life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it comes off the roll. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's how it's going to be in the end times. The closer we get to the end times, 
the faster it comes off the row. And you're all waiting for 2021. I'm praying for a vaccine too. It'd be nice, get things back to normal. But let me tell you something. Something else is gonna pop up. If you think the rioting and looting has stopped, it hasn't stopped. It's gonna get worse. But that's okay as Christians. We look up for our redemption draws near. We're gonna be raptured. And we ought to be excited. But the only way we can be excited is if we are a pure and holy church. If we allow Jesus to clean the leaven out, to burn it up, get rid of it. Are you ready to get rid of the leaven? That's a decision you have to make. Let's stand. Now, if you're here this morning, you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let me say this. You're not going to heaven. There's only one way to go to heaven, and that's through Jesus. And just because you say a prayer doesn't get you to heaven. Just because you believe in Jesus doesn't get you to heaven. You have to believe in Jesus and make him Lord of your life. You won't be perfect. You'll still screw up. You'll still make mistakes. It doesn't matter because Jesus has paid for all of those. But the thing is, you have to want Jesus to be Lord of your life. If you're here this morning, you've never made Jesus Lord of your life. If you've never put your faith in him, I'm going to give you that opportunity. I am going to say a prayer. And if you want to receive Jesus, if you want to make him Lord of your life, if you want to go to heaven when you die, you need to repeat this prayer. The prayer's not magic, but if you believe what you're saying, that faith, that believing that God raised Jesus from the dead, and speaking with your mouth that you want Jesus to be Lord, the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. What do you mean saved? Saved from your sin. In other words, sin is what brings forth death, which takes us to hell. But Jesus came to give us life, eternal life. He deals with that sin by paying the penalty. So if you want to receive Jesus, you just need to say this prayer with me and believe what you're saying and make Jesus Lord. I want everyone to bow their heads, close their eyes. If you're online with us and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just say this prayer with me wherever you are. Here goes. God, I know I'm a sinner and I know that my sin has separated me from you. But God, I believe you love me. And because you love me, you sent your son Jesus to die for my sin. And I believe that when Jesus died, his soul went to hell to pay the penalty for my sin. But I also believe that when all of my sin was paid for, God, you looked into hell and you saw a soul that never sinned, even in being made my sin. Therefore, you raised Jesus from the dead. And I believe that when Jesus was raised from the dead, I came to life with him that at that very moment I was born again I was regenerated and now the same spirit that raised him from the dead now dwells within me and Jesus I want you to be Lord of my life I want you to clean my life up I want to be that temple where the Holy Spirit's living in me and I don't want it to be a den of thieves I don't want it to be a house of merchandise I want it to be a pure and holy house, fit for you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me.